I want to apologize. I, I, my clothes are in Ohio or someplace. I don't know where I got bumped last night. Um, th- this is really for novice people, but there are some things I can talk about that might surprise you a little bit. Um, don't laugh at his head. My dog's name is Rocky, and he's a Schutzen three. He goes for the throat. But uh, anyway, uh, his proportions are really good, and he's a good mover. From here to here, he's 30 inches. And from here to to here, he's 25 and a half. And that's exactly 8 and a half to 10. 50% of his... um, 50% of his height is right to the elbow from the top of the wither. And of course the other part is 50% from there to the ground. But if you take into consideration a little muscle, hair, and growth underneath, he is about 55 to 45. Let me start with a hindquarter. The croup is made up of these two angles right here. And the, the best angle for this bone here is 45 degrees. Now, the reason they like it at 45, at least I've been told and it makes sense, is that you get the maximum amount of thrust with the minimum amount of effort when the dog has an angle here of 45, right here. Now, of course, he has to have the rest of the structure in sequence and also it has to be in the right proportions. So this angle is 45, and this angle is less than 45, and what you see is this. Now our standard, if I'm not mistaken, says long and sloping, but this angle that you see here should be about 30 degrees, 28 degrees, and it should be long. Now when the, when the puppy is born, this bone and this bone are not fused, but they fuse lighter. And I am told that the angle doesn't change, but the length does. Now the upper arm, I mean the the femur, should be a little shorter than the stifle, as it is here. And then you go down to the hock and, and and the foot. Now, the angle formed when this dog is set up like this and he should be square is about 120 degrees and I think Dave might have mentioned that in his uh, his tour it should be about 120 degrees now they say the angulation in the rear is equal to the angulation in the front and it is but it is equal when you put the foot here under the thigh I mean under the the point of, of the hip so you get A 90 degree here, and a 90 degree here, and a 90 degree here, pretty much. And that's the way it's supposed to be. If you got too much of this, you end up with overangulation, and in some cases, you get too, you just have too much, and the dog doesn't function as well. But they can function. We have some dogs that do not follow through as well as they should. Now here's the thing. There's two reasons for that. One is that this is too steep and he can't come through or he hits the wall and then he comes back up like this and he doesn't have a clean sweep with his hindquarter. However, that's one reason if the croup is too steep. If the croup is flat, you'll come through but you come up off the ground and you might have trouble coming up underneath yourself. That's one reason you lock up, and I will show you why. The other reason is up here. If the dog can give you 10 pounds of thrust in the rear, and the front can only take eight, I'm making this up, the front's got to do something in order to take what the rear can give. And he might do several things for a while. He might loft a little in front, and he's biding time till till, till his ass then catches up. Or... After a while, he'll get tired of doing that, and he may not follow through as well. He might stop, because that's what the front will take. Am I making sense? Okay. A dog who follows through well will keep this foot on the ground past the 90 degree. 
Now, he won't keep it on there forever, but the longer he keeps that foot on the ground, assuming the front can take it, the more of a shove he'll give himself off. Assuming he's in the point when this dog touches the ground with his forefront, with his front leg, is zero. Zero force. Zero. It's just like you. This is zero. When you hit the, f hit the ground with your foot after you push up, it's zero. It's not, you're not getting anything out of At that point, you don't have any force. It's coming from the other end. So it's zit. <clears throat> it's zero right here. And then he goes on to the next step. Dogs who have suspension keep their feet close to the ground. And the suspension happens at a, at a good sized trot. You're going to have to, the dog's got to be hitting it. If I can show you this side first and then I'll show you the other side. The suspension comes just before this foot hits the ground and after this leg is off the ground and it's ready to come back to the next step. Now that's this side. The opposite side, this foot will just be coming off the ground and this leg will be coming down. So you got a book you got just a split second, maybe a, a second or so, the dog will be suspended. But um, that's when the, uh, the period of suspension will happen if the dog's in good balance. It's got to be in good balance. And the two ends got to work as a unit. But let's say this bone here was a lot longer. And to make him put this foot on the ground, he'd have a lot more ass end. It looks, some people think that's wonderful because the dog give you all this stuff and you accentuate his top line. But the truth of the matter is, he's a little out of balance. So what happens, in particular, if the front can't handle it, the dog will lock his ass up when he comes through. He won't go through. Or he'll be, when he puts his foot on the ground, instead of putting the foot on the ground, he'll lay almost, lay the whole hock on the ground. So when he comes through. Now, I'm not telling you that means he's a bum dog, he can't finish, he, he, he's not good looking, but there's something to think about. If you've got a couple of good ones, and one dog does this, and... oh yes, one other thing, I'll tell you. You've got a good mover, a good mover. What's he do with his head? He brings the thing down, and I can't show it. There's almost a straight line from here right down the top line to here on dogs who have good fronts and move well. They lay into it. And uh, these, you see, you see in some of the classes, now in a small ring it's difficult. But when you get in the larger rings and you can let the dog out and he's on a loose lead, not on a tight lead, the better movers, the better dogs with good fronts, they'll lay into the... Can you show them a lot talk on that? Yeah. As it goes through. That's a locked hock. See, he don't open up. He, it's, instead of him going like this, he, he goes like this. He hits the wall. Now, listen, you're not going to see locked hocks when a dog's going really slow. I mean, some of them will move like that. But when he's opened up, that thing should come through. I mean, on good movers. And listen, they all got something you can pick on, for crying out loud. And for every inch he lifts him, his front off the ground, he comes back an inch. And you get some dogs, instead of going over the ground, <clears throat> they have a little tendency to loft themselves so their motion isn't all across the ground, it's up and off the ground. If the, the shoulder doesn't do much, it, it goes a little bit like this. And... I don't know if I could, the upper arm only comes to about here. Now some dogs will bend a little at this point, but the foot touches the ground just about in this position, maybe here just in the, just ahead of the chest. And the difference between a real good mover and a good mover is only about that much. Listen, I wouldn't get really overexcited about coming and going unless the dog is atrocious. I mean, if he's, a little, if he's a little off or something like that, okay. But if you've got a better one that can do all that and is straight, fine. But don't take him from first and put him 19th because he's a little off coming and going. You follow me? I mean, you know, I'll tell you what I look for. <clears throat> and I don't get him right all the time. 
I just look for a dog that's smooth. And when he's on a loose lead, he sort of coordinates well. He doesn't screw himself up. He looks like a German Shepherd and fine. You know, um, that's what I really look for. If you got a couple like that, then you start breaking it down. Maybe one's a little better going and the other one's a little better coming or something. Um, I'll tell you what happens sometimes. You get a little too much back here, or the dog, if you get a little too much, too much length of bone sometimes. Sometimes. You take a look at some of these videos, and it's funny. The dog, the dog instead of being able to cleanly come through, and he should have his feet close to the ground, he gives you a little, a, he drags the toes a little bit. Um, and it's pretty obvious after a while. And there are some dogs who have, they're smooth. They, they have a smoothness to them when they move, but they, they do drag the toes a little bit. It's, it's not exactly locking up, but it's not good because it's not going to last forever if the dog is going for any distance. It's going to tire him. It's going to bother him. It's just, I mean, I can't walk like this, you know, but that's what happens after a while. But you look at you look at the class in, in in the ring, and you know there's some dogs that jump out at you. They're attractive, and I'm assuming they're attractive because they're formed nice. It has nothing to do with their color or or things like that. They they're formed pretty well. Um, and when the dog moves, assuming he's not on a tight lead or the handle isn't jerking him around, and he keeps himself pretty much together, he could be one of your good guys. I have a simplistic approach to judging. I look at the German Shepherd.